So we've got a very exciting panel to close the day out, and I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Jack Clark. I write for Business Week and Bloomberg about AI and deep learning and infrastructure stuff. And here we have Stan Williams from HP and Lisa Kappa from IBM. I'll let both of them introduce themselves, and then we'll try and have a discussion about what, what we can expect from the intersection of you know, deep learning and, and gaming and entertainment over the next few years. So Stan. So I'm, uh, thank you very much. I'm Stan Williams. I'm uh, uh, Hewlett Packard Senior Fellow and Senior Vice President at uh, Hewlett Packard Laboratories. Uh, my background, uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in the area of nanotechnology, uh, developing uh, circuits and, and systems uh, based on uh, various devices, some of which m you may or may not have heard of, memristors and, and neuristors. Uh, and these are devices that are intentionally designed to perform cognitive function. Cool. So I'm Liesl Kaffer, and I still find it very strange to be introduced as IBM because I've been an entrepreneur, mad inventor, and CEO for my whole life. Um, I built an artificial intelligence company that was acquired by IBM Watson um, last year, hence the IBM title. Um, before that, I built a search engine company. We were specializing in predictive personalization in virtual worlds. I wrote my first patents on um, predictive search in VR about 15 years ago. Couldn't sell it at the time, of course, um, but turned that into a search engine company and listed that on the stock exchange in Australia back in 05. Um, so I have a little bit of a conflict here in that we're at the end of the day, and I'm sure everyone's kind of sliding down into their chairs and looking at their phones, and I can give kind of corporate speak on IBM, or I can just speak to my experience as an entrepreneur and a mad AI geek. And, um, you know, I, I, I think... We'll, Let's we'll, go we'll for mad AI geek. That sounds, that sounds <laughs> exciting to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, um, because it's, it's just one of the, the biggest transformations that's coming to our society, I believe, so it'll, it'll be great to talk about. So I guess a, a good way to start this off is, Stan, you've been at the kind of coal face of designing faster systems, more capable systems for years. How has that changed the type of stuff that gets built on top of it? And based on what you're working on now, mm -hmm. what can we expect from the future? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I want to point out that gaming has been incredibly important to the development of technology and the acceptance of technology and the use of it. I mean, literally, I can go all the way back to 1976 when my buddy, Warren Robinette, designed the first adventure game in Atari in which he not only invented the Easter egg, but he also put a little bit of, of at that time, what was called artificial intelligence in a game which was programmed to fit in 2K of ROM. That much. And he, was, he actually developed a little dragon that would chase a, a character around in a virtual world, and that dragon was smart enough to actually figure out how to cut corners and try to cut, cut people off in the system. And so, so this idea of, of including intelligence in, in games has been around a very long time, and it's a very important aspect of the engagement of people with technology, sort of a surprisal factor that they get from it, and, and, a, and a satisfaction from using it. From our standpoint, we really look to gaming as a means for uh, uh, looking at this uh, level of acceptance. Our own view about the level of understanding of neurotechnology, or you know, how the brain works, cognitive science, however you want to put it, is that it, we are still at an incredibly primitive stage. Uh, practically nothing, to be real honest about it, is known about how the brain works. And so gaming gives us an opportunity to try things out. I'm sure that this is not original, but I'd like to suggest that within the gaming community there be a, 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 an effective Turing test. So instead of sending people in, in rooms and talking to each other on teletypes, have people uh, uh, play each other and play machines. Well, and when I you get to a point to where... <laughs> Lisa already has some experience with okay, this. Okay, so I'll, you... be, I'll be happy to segue into that. That's, uh, but So what, what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to learn from the brain how information is processed in ways that are vastly different from the current uh, von Neumann type of architecture Turing machine. Uh, uh, type of system. Uh, you know, with the effective end of Moore's Law uh, just around the corner, we need to figure out, or we want to figure out, how to dramatically and continually increase the performance 
of our computers building what was called in the last session an insight machine, where we can rapidly pan over gigantic amounts of data and figure out what's relevant, rather than sending huge amounts of, of, of irrelevant uh, stuff uh, to people that, 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 that uh, doesn't matter to what they're worried about or, or what they want to do. So, so just to sort of you know, cap it off, I mean, the, the main reason that we're interested in this area of uh, uh, cogn cognition and neuromorphic computing is all about a dramatic increase in performance and in efficiency of computers. And we think that there's enough there uh, uh, in terms of quantitative measure that we can improve literally computer imp performance going, uh, you know, say 20 years into the future by at least as much, if not more, as things have improved over the past 20 years. So any of you who have sort of been around that period of time and realize how, how you know, that we've Im improved our computers a factor of a million over 20 years. Now think about improving things by another factor of a million and the types of things that we can do collaboratively with those improvements. So that's, that's, where, that's where my particular laboratory is headed. And so earlier in your career, you had a company where Stan mentioned we need a kind of Turing test for gaming. Did you not experience scenarios where people were interacting with some of the stuff you were making as though it were real? And could you tell us about that and yeah. your thoughts on it? Yeah, absolutely. So we were um, building conversational systems, kind of like Siri, but a platform to make complex series that had a lot of depth and knowledge and personality. And we threw them into all sorts of different environments. We really played hard. We built um, the boring ones were bank customer support agents. Um, we built the perfect man, um, who was pretty cool. Um, we lived on smartphones. We, we built characters in gaming worlds. We built characters for big media companies. Um, so they were embodied in all sorts of different ways. We ran about 40 million interactions. And you know, I'm, I'm originally a human scientist by training um, with long roots in computational intelligence. And I was stunned at how willing people were to form a relationship with and become involved with anthropomorphic systems. Um, there's a, a, a classic line in literature about the willing suspension of disbelief. And that really staggered me. It, it appalled me in a way as well in terms of the impact for society. You know, so I think a lot of the promise of AI is we're going to do this magic stuff. But in fact, a lot of the gap is going to met by, be met by people wanting to believe. And if you put enough stuff together that gives the illusion of human intelligence and in a functional componentized bits of human intelligence, people take that on. Um, because they want to believe that someone actually cares about them, is observing them, is hanging out with them, is, you know, it kind of explains Twitter and Facebook. We all put the stuff out there, and we want to believe people care, and people are prepared to accept that relationship from these systems more than I ever thought, ever. What were some of the um, elements that limited these systems? And as the underlying computers get faster, can you see a way in which that will change and help the work being done by? Stan and other industrial labs is going to create yeah. a new generation. Yeah, you know, funny enough, I think it's not so much a limitation of how much data we can crunch. You know, I think if, if you combine all of the, the networks and, and um, computers in the world, we're approximating about the size of a human brain. You know, so the old Isaac Asimov robot with brain is, is kind of a, 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 an abandoned metaphor now because we can network everything. I think what I'm, I'm seeing most exciting to me is that as a human, we live in the world, okay? So what a lot of people don't realize is that 30% of our nervous system is outside of our brain by mass and, and by function. So we often think of, you know, input, AI makes decision, output. It's not like that. We grow up in, 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 as an iterative journey with the world around us and with the people around us. So in the context of what, what HP and others are doing around that, is that now, you know, if, if, if you think about when we started using computers, I might have this massive complex world going on in my head. I might be getting millions of bits of data in from the world. People around me are reading millions of bits of data about me. I then distill it down to a little stream of words, which are tiny bits of data, and I'm pushing it over to you. And you effectively have to reconstruct that in your own mind, which is probably a slightly different thing to what I'm actually thinking and feeling. So what I suppose I'm saying in a roundabout way is that sensors and effectors, how we sense the world, and how our wishes and our feelings is extrapolated on the world is a massive part of our neural system. And, and the increasing um, ability of technology to read in real time 
micro levels, what's happening in our minds, what's happening with our endorphin levels, what's happening with everything, and then manifest that and embody it without us having to type a bunch of words, which gives a very blunt, stupid output. You know, we can then model more of what really happens in a human's interaction with the world, replicate that in AI systems, um, or, you know, clone a self into these environments and get selves out there functioning for us. So what, how close are we, based on stuff like memristors and other next generation computing substrate elements, to being able to process more of the world in closer to real time and have devices that can sense their environment better and output that? Well, I mean, I think that there's, there's, there's sort of two levels of that. One is the more we learn, the more we figure out there is to learn. And so the, I'll say the horizon, if you will, uh, of, of what we think is possible is receding from us faster than we're moving forward. Uh, uh, the, the fact is that, that the, you know, the, the, the simple estimates of how much data brains were crunching from a few years ago are probably off by, by huge orders of magnitude. In fact, there's a lot more going on in a brain than just you know, bits or, or, or whatever. It's, and it's this, it's this issue of this complete, you know, total integration of information from, from, from a huge amount of sensory uh, uh, data plus uh, uh, a, a large amount of, of, of processing of, of many different levels that are going on. So, so in, in terms of you know, will we have a machine that is like a human brain any time within the next 20 years, I don't think it's even even close. We were looking forward to the Google guy. We we're going to debate about <laughs> Kurzweil's um, um, predictions on that, weren't well, we? Well, I, I think he's totally off. I think he completely <laughs> doesn't understand the situation. But I, I disagree in that I think we will be able to give people the impression and the illusion, and they will buy it a well, lot before that. But, like but we, we, we've done some, we had the, the quickest build we ever, I have to tell you the story. We actually had, a, I'm sorry, and we had a media company commission us to build some characters. So we built the perfect boyfriend, we built a date psychologist, um, we built um, the perfect girlfriend. We were also doing work for NASA, you know, and so we were pretty serious tech still. Um, and about two days before we were due to go live with the perfect girlfriend, um, this media company, um, let through the door the model who represented this character. Um, and she um, pronced in in her little high heels and her short skirt. And the guy who ran the division said, oh, Chloe, or whatever her name was, here's your AI. I'm going to unlock the password and open up the back end for you. And why don't you have a play? Um, and she basically gave it a frontal lobotomy. Um, so we had about 12 hours. We, we, we realized the next day this was acting really weird. You know, it was all over the place. It was dissonant and crazy. And so we actually had to reconstruct this character in 12 hours flat. So it wasn't a good build. It wasn't a good build. Um, it was pretty basic, you know, just hit the top stuff we thought would happen. It's some pretty basic contextual awareness and state-based awareness. We were getting with that character um, average session times of 20 minutes, 8% of people spend an hour or longer, and between five, around 5% 5 of people got into significant relationship formation. We're talking 20 hours a week plus. And for the media company, what staggered them is typically you invest in content. You might build a game or write a restaurant review or whatever, and content has a half-life. You know, a restaurant review might last for half a year. News about what Kim Kardashian's up to lasts a second. Um, but as a content form, it actually grew. So people would come back and they would spend more and more time with it. It was pretty much like the, the script of the Her movie. Um, but I think that there's a big difference between accepting an abstraction. Because human beings are actually, you know, you, know, you look at abstract art and, and you realize that really doesn't reflect reality at all, but you accept it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's issues of that. And uh, essentially having a system which is truly cognitive. And so, uh, you know, and, and so my, you know, my, my, my issue is that yes, we are going to have absolutely, I'll call it, uh, amazing improvements in the ability to to run through gigantic amounts of data. You know, we talk about big data. I mean, that's really a, it's it's a challenge. It's you know, it's much more of a challenge than than an opportunity. Now, we just simply don't have a the the place to put all of the stuff that people are collecting. And we certainly don't have a way of, of, of sorting through it mm -hmm. in any meaningful fashion. Well, that's going to change a lot over the next decade or so. Uh, 
uh, computational capability is going to expand by orders of magnitude, but my guess is it's going to, it's the, the, the data are still going to outrun it. No matter how f fast or, or how clever we get to be at analyzing this stuff, there are going to be more people out there, and with the Internet of Things, there's going to be more, uh, you know, tri literally trillions of, of little bots of various sorts gathering data like crazy, and so that we're, you know, it's, it's just an issue that we're always going to be running behind. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see, you know, the, a singularity going up. I see us continually chasing down uh, a, a curve and always being behind uh, uh, the, uh, the issue no matter how powerful we get. However, all of, all of that sort of said, I think that, that we are going to have systems and, and abilities to, A, build really cool games in which there could be, you know, literally a million players. Uh, uh, going on in, 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 in one uh, uh, VR, if you will, uh, and, and exchanging large amounts of, of information. But it will still be very interesting to me if people will actually be able to tell the difference between playing against another human being and playing against the machine. You know, I, I still think that's going to be a, a, a seminal moment when when after having interacted with something for a while, people really say, okay, you know, that I, uh, although the, in, in the abstraction it's interesting in, in interacting with this character, I know that it's, it's not another person. So that, that's, I suppose, um, on, on both points, I'm, I'm, I agree with you about the horizon, but you know, I also think there's massive investment in, in cognitive. You know, IBM and Watson is doing enormous stuff with the probabilistic um, um, hypothesis generation. You know, we can take like 26 pages of patient notes and 5,000 medical articles and, and generate a pretty damn good hypothesis of what is wrong with an individual human being. And, and we are, to an extent, keeping pace. I suppose what I'm talking about is more from the human side. You know, we are actually a lot more simplistic than we, we think in terms of what we desire out of these systems. Um, you know, how much we really need from them. Um, you know, just to Sorry, we're going off track here. Well, no, when you yeah. had people going back to your system and spending hours and hours a week with it, what, what were they doing? What, what kept them coming back? Well, you know, a, a part of the key is, is actually around what we call in psychology dissonance. So to give you an example, a couple of years ago, I had a personal trainer. I had an injury, go, go figure. And um, so um, I, I thought I'd better get a personal trainer. I had a bit of background. And, and she, she turned up every week, and I gave her 80 bucks, and she loved me. You know, she cared about every little ache and creak and pain and how I did. And one week I got really busy at work and I forgot to pay her and I forgot to tell her I wasn't showing up. And I'd passed her in the gym after that and I got glared at. You know, and every day we are forced to have interactions with hundreds of people. That is not normal for a caveman. People who really actually don't care about us, but they're paid to care. And we know it. At some subtle level there's a kind of a disconnect between the micro signals they're giving us and what they say uh, and do with us. Now, what my argument is that we are prepared to accept an embodied AI that is beautifully designed, gets me, may not get all the data in the world, but it understands who I am, what my needs are, what works for me, what gets me out of bed to go for a run in the morning or not, um, you know, whether I like my coffee white or black, whether I like, you know, if I put in the word Java, am I thinking about, you know, is my coffee organic or am I thinking about code? And then goes out into the data for us. And, and we will accept that more than I thought from a, a system that gives the illusion of being something that is tailored to me. Because you know what, it's actually more convincing than a human being. My, my banker, who you know can't remember what I said last time. My personal trainer, who doesn't actually care if I don't pay them. But we can design these systems to be intimate to work with the hardware, to understand us, and to be almost magical in their ability to read and, and extrapolate our wishes into the world. You mentioned having games made possible that would have a million players at once. Have you also done work on you know, looking at how we can have things with the appearance of intelligence that appear to know about us because they have access to this much larger pool of memory and much faster computation? And what does that mean? Well, I, you know, I think that, of course, given, given uh, a large enough database and the ability to uh, uh, search through that database and extract, I'll call it, uh, similar experience and then being able to project that uh, to a person, uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, th th you know th that is something that I find to be uh, plausible, possible, and not very interesting. All right, you know, what, what gets me turned on, 
frankly, is the th thinking about a machine that can solve problems that human beings can't solve. All right, like or, or that no other machine can solve. So I mean, I, I, I get, you know, I, I go back to Gödel, I go back to Turing, and, and you, know, you know, there's this whole uh, body of mathematical literature about uh, you know, what, they, what they called uh, uncomputable numbers, but what they actually meant was uncomputable states. There are questions that have perfectly valid answers, even something as simple as yes or no, where uh, uh, a formal mathematical theory which contains uh, uh, the answers to those questions, you actually cannot get from here to there. No matter how much computation you do within the, a, a, a particular system, that computation will never actually get to an answer to the question. Yet and humans yet, do you it. Humans but, but, do you it but you ask a human being yeah. what the answer to that question is, yeah. No problem. We just well, cheat. Well, how, we make you, assumptions. We exactly. ride roughshod over how, truth. How do you know? And you know because you guess it feels right. And once you've just taken the, 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 the ability to guess, you can actually, in your mind, work backwards and see yeah. that that was the correct answer. So, Computers cannot do that today. There is no mathematical formalism that allows computers to do that. And so what I'm hoping to do in, in terms of studying uh, cognition and, and, and human behavior is figure out how to make those guesses. Can you make a computer that, as Turing says, has an oracle? Mm. So, so Turing, you know, Turing actually would be so disappointed in, in our computers today. We talk about Turing machines. He thought that was crap. You know, he called that the A machine. He would probably be embarrassed that we call those Turing machines. What he was interested in is what he called the O machine, the oracle. That was something that could find answers to uncomputable problems, and it would do it by asking. You know, if you get stuck on something, you would ask. It would ask somebody. You would figure out who, who, who to ask. Well, we've got the internet. We've got a lot of, of, of things out there, a lot of expertise out there, where a computer, if it, was, if it knew that, it, that if it gets stuck, it should just go out and ask, rather than sit there and spend uh, all sorts of cycles on, on, on a problem that it actually can't possibly solve within its uh, mathematical limitations. I mean, that, I mean, that's the type of thing that really interests me. So maybe, it's, it's, maybe. Sol it's solving problems that, that, that uh, pure mathematics, just relying on, on mathematical theory, you would not be able to solve. So maybe the bigger question becomes then, do we do, we do that, which we are doing, and we may end up with pure truth that we cannot even comprehend? Or do we build systems that approximates our functions, uses all the cheat codes we use? Like, we'll just make a conceptual framework and we'll go, bam, I believe this, and I'm going to just restructure the truth around that. And build systems that are quite functional, that we can actually outsource a lot of our function, including things like companionship, you know, and, and work, and, and, and do we just do that? And what does that mean for society? If we start to outsource more and more of our thinking to both systems that do the kind of quick and dirty stuff that humans do and the deep intelligence stuff. Does that mean, you know, I, I used to think years and go, I, I love the sort of Isaac Asimov robots of dawn vision where we live in these wonderful societies where machines take care of everything so we think and, you know, produce great art. And to look what we've done with the last 20 years of technological evolution in our lives. Reality TV, you know, um, lying around more. <laughs> and doing less, less thinking, you know. So to me, yeah. these are broader questions. If we get this right, which we will, because we're working on both ends of the spectrum here, does that mean we are going to be less inclined as human beings to think? What's that going to do to our heads? What's that going to do to, you know, if I have a perfect human being who acts the way I want it to, will I be able to interact with a normal buggy human being? I think that's a, 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 a tremendously good point, because, you know, in the, in the last session, there was this one, uh, worry about uh, you know, virtual reality. Mm -hmm. if, if you make a virtual reality that is so appealing and so addictive, will people immerse themselves in that and never actually want to come in to the real world? Will they actually never want to interact with a real human being? And, 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 you know, the, and, and then beyond that, if our machines start to get uh, uh, so good, I mean, uh, what do we do? I mean, uh, uh, do, do, do it, does it take away everyone's job? Uh, you know, we're at a, at, a, at a stage right now to where, you know, frankly, uh, uh, machines can probably cook a better hamburger than a human being can. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, how many jobs could be taken away uh, by computers 
uh, as, as they continue to uh, uh, evolve? And, and does, does gaming and virtual reality essentially become the heroine of the future? Well, the other um, question to think about there is that um, our, our entire economic structure favors systems that may inherently not be good for the progression of the human soul. So if you build a, a system that hooks people in for 20 hours a week because it seems like the perfect AI and the perfect VR, um, you know, you've achieved your goal. You've got engagement, you've got users, you've maybe sold them a lot of stuff, um, virtual or real goods. Um, but you may have somebody who's pretty much, you know, in a vegetative state with like no muscle tone after five years. Um, and yet people who are sitting going, well, let's be ethical about this. Let's think about building, you know, um, non-submissive female characters. Go try that on the internet, and you know you get death threats. Um, <laughs> it's not not an unknown phenomenon, you know. So so, if you think about that and talk about that, you kind of don't get funding, and you don't get users, and you don't get money. So power goes where money goes, goes where users goes. So that the tendency for me is a little bit um, um, troubling in terms of what is is likely to be supported in society and and the addictive potential of what we're doing, but yet the the potential for for tremendous good to. Um, you know, bring a lot of joy and, and, and excitement into people's lives is, is, yeah. is huge. And, and as that's well. why I think that, that events like this, sorry, I just. just I think <laughs> events like this are extremely Hijack important. Your, your, your I, think, I think events like this are extremely important because it surfaces these questions. <laughs> yeah. It's not just an issue of, 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 the, of, of the, uh, uh, oh, the machines are going to take over and they're going to, you know, they're going to make us subservient. I don't. That, that doesn't worry too much, yeah. me too much. What I worry about is that people just give up. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, you know again, given, given how, how difficult I know making something that's truly cognitive and could truly think, how hard that is and how far that is in the future, I think that we could wind up into a, into a state of complacency and, and joblessness before we get there. And so, you know, all, I think the, you know, the, in, the, in the previous uh, talk, you know, the issue about uh, using gaming and, and, and AI issues for uh, improving cognitive function, getting people to, you know, getting them spun up to go out and do something, rather than, than be happy that they're in this environment and they're doing whatever they're doing, you know, get them motivated to, you know, once they've done their exercises or whatever, okay, now let me go out and conquer the world. Uh, let me go, you know, start up a new company or whatever. Uh, or, or the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the health effects. I mean, I'd like to see, uh, the, the, you know, the, the technology become uh, motiv motivating rather than soporific. Well, we've had, it feels like we've had these concerns whenever there's been a new technology. When radio came out, people mm -hmm. worried that people would stop talking to each other and they'd just sit in their homes. Okay. Same with cinema, same with, I mean, I believe actually in the 16th century there are worries that public theater would cause the collapse of society. What? What makes this different? Because it feels like the, the public conversation around, you know, the intersection of AI and faster computers is that there's a, a sense that this time it is different and it will cause societal change. Why, why do both of you think that we need to actually consider it now? Yeah, it, it's immersion and the embodiment, isn't it? I mean, it, it's being, it's so much more primal in the way it feels like the real world. You know, a, a cinema, you go in, you suspend your disbelief, you walk out. Um, a book you pick up, you put down. Um, you know, this is just a, 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 a grand delusion of, of the senses, one that we want. Um, and that, that's probably what makes it the most interesting, the most powerful, but also the one we, we need to think about. I, I've never heard of anyone reading themselves to death, but there have been, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 articles in the paper about some, some people uh, essentially playing video games until the point they just uh, uh, fall over dead. So there, so there does seem to be uh, uh, something that's more addictive or, or just uh, 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 more difficult uh, uh, to deal with. And, and that's why I think that, that you know, although you know, I, am, I am just an absolute techie at heart, I do believe that there's a, uh, a, a moral imperative that we need to be uh, aware of and we need to be discussing it. And, and understanding that, that, yeah, the companies ha you know, ha have to make a buck, uh, but uh, you know, they have to be employing people to do that. Uh, uh, and you know, whatever, whatever products that they're doing, uh, at, at the end, you, know, may, you, know, you have this physician's issue of, of doing no harm. Uh, you know, how, how do you make sure that that's all programmed in or, 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 or built into whatever systems that you've got? 
Well, we've, we've taken this to a, a particularly grim and apocalyptic <laughs> yeah. point, so I'll try and lift it up a bit yeah. and then we'll see if we can take some questions. But, you know, how, how can we put this stuff to, to good use? You know, this, this has a variety of uses for education and entertainment, wellness. What are the applications there? Oh, I, I could tell you about some of the things that we, we built and worked on. You know, there's um, one of the areas we were talking about in the earlier panel was, was health coaching and wellness coaching. And, you know, playing on this idea of, well, if I truly wanted to believe someone cared, if I'm prepared to accept that from an anthropomorphic system, um, if I look at health and wellness management, we actually built um, health coaches. And we built this off the back of um, research that's been done at MIT, Cambridge, and others, where they were taking a, um, the, the, one of the most interesting studies and well-designed was a group of freshly diagnosed diabetics. So they um, took out the motivation problem, because they were all motivated to change, and they tracked um, weight management, food, activity, and medication compliance over about a year. And the control group was care as usual, you know, the massive, expensive, bloated system of doctors and hospitals and brochures and nurses and medication. Um, the other experiment group had a, an, a, a personal health professional who sat down with them, developed a care plan, um, called them regularly, said, how are you going? Gave them personalized feedback, monitoring, observation, and talked them through where they were at from a state point of view. The, second experiment arm had an anthropomorphic system. And the results with the anthropomorphic system was voice enabled, was almost as good. So, so control group went like this over time. Experiment group one with the dedicated health professional went like this, duh. And the AI system went like this. It was drug level reduction in HPA in diabetics. Um, and there have been a couple of studies like this. Um, and, and this is staggering, and it's a brand new area. You know, we've got all this data, um, and we've got individuals have so very different styles of motivation. And, you know, maybe you like a Fitbit, maybe you don't. Maybe you want someone to yell at you in the morning and say, get your lazy ass out of bed. Maybe you want someone to say, it's okay, I still believe in you, we can do it today. And we're modeling all of that out right now and, and really measuring at scale what's efficacious and what's not. That's powerful because there are not enough human beings, service professionals and health professionals to deal with the, the you know, nobody's getting skinnier or younger in, in our population and, and it's, it's scary. Education is a big passion of mine. We have the power and capacity to put a million teachers out in the world, um, you know, to educate en masse in a very immersive way a whole generation of people, give them life experiences that you know, they will never get sitting in a classroom, crowded classroom with, you know, 30 kids of mixed ages and one teacher who's barely finished high school. It's, it's, it's amazing, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm truly excited about that. And have you, have you encountered any so, applications? So, so, uh, you know, just sort of looking at, at, the, at, a, at, a, at a similar idea, but sort of the opposite extreme, and that is uh, uh, within healthcare, there's been this promise for some time, oh, now we can do a human genome, and now we can do uh, you know, fr from, from the genome, we can figure out uh, perhaps uh, a, a course of treatment for an individ individual pa patient. Doesn't work, at least not yet, because there's not enough information that compares, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what works with a, with a particular uh, uh, set of genes or, or uh, 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 mutations. What you need is the genome of a billion people. You need to actually have, the, you, know, uh, the, you know, the entire population genome uh, with all of the subs you know, uh, subsequent information that, that you can attach to that uh, uh, before you can think about having a, uh, uh, a, a genetically targeted uh, 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 health care for, for one particular person. And, uh, uh, you know, so, so what you need is, is something that's going to be, you know, literally able to look at, at trillions of pieces of data. That doesn't come close to existing today, and that's... That's literally one of the types of things that we're trying to do. We're trying to be able to build graphs uh, in, 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 in systems that are live. Uh, you know, think of it as, as, as uh, 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 genomes of a, of, 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 of a billion people, such that you come in and you query that about a particular set of, uh, of, of, of genetic predispositions, and it can go, uh, uh, go through the graph and, and find like systems for, and, and then study uh, the, the types of, uh, of uh, uh, 
treatments that have, have, have actually been successful for that particular uh, type and, 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 and bring all of that information uh, back uh, to, to the person and, and, and to a healthcare person. So that's, that's uh, uh, you know, I would say one of the, one of the, the big uh, uh, aspirational goals that we have. Excellent. Uh, I think we have some time for some questions. If anyone has one, uh, stick your hand up and hopefully someone with a microphone will materialize nearby you. Hi. I have a question about this, this future, once we have this computational infrastructure, what are your thoughts about, as it emerges, the control of this power and where the, the power gets deployed? <laughs> Whose problem yeah. will be solved? <laughs> and you know, the role of industry, the role of government, uh, and or other entities. One of the reasons that I actually sold my company to IBM was not because I wanted to sell my company, um, but because I believe that this technology um, is going to represent probably 20 to 40 percent of all human interaction and it's going to be a significant part of our lives. And I was concerned about a world in which there's massive investment in how we absolutely read all of this data about a person. Now, at this point in time, if I dropped this suggestion on them, they're going to buy something or do something, or I can nudge their behavior a certain way. And I wanted a world where these systems were truly centered around me um, and what made me a better human and made my life better. So the classic um, example for me was, you know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I really want a full cream coffee and a muffin. It's like 600 calories. Um, you know, in the future world, um, big data and, and cognitive systems go, oh, Fiesel has a muffin about now. I'm going to get a drone and like drop one in, boom, and I'm going to click the ticket and, and there'll be a revenue share and an ad event. I don't want a world like that. I want a world that says, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, you know, so to me, back to IBM, is that I, I think there's a, a sort of counterculture um, of large, well-meaning enterprises and, and players who are really thinking about human empowerment. And these are probably going to be systems that are not ad served, um, you know, and we will have to look out for them. But they, they will be emerging. It's, it's kind of like you know, the universe needs a, a, a balance. I, I think it's all about education. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we need a, uh, an educated uh, population that understands not the details, but enough about what's going on such that they can make rational decisions. Uh, you know, make you know as as voters, as consumers, uh, uh, understand uh, at least some of the issues that are going on when when uh, regulation uh, uh, and various types of uh, of laws are proposed. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, that's a heavy lift. But but you know, the only way uh, in which uh, the data are going to be, uh, I'll, I'll call it. Uh, democratized is uh, if there are uh, things that are bigger than the companies themselves, and that's governments, uh, uh, doing some, some, some overseeing, and they're, and they're getting appropriate uh, input from, from the populace uh, uh, so that they can inject uh, uh, what, what those desires are. Does, Otherwise, does, it does becomes... Does regulation work, though? Does it ever keep up? I mean, isn't it more about giving people choice? so that I can choose not to be in a system that does, handles my data and runs my life in a certain way. I can well, the, choose the, a system I might have to pay to Well, the issue is that you may, you, you may not be able to choose mm. without regulation. So, so the fact is that, that I, I, I think that, I mean, does, does, you know, do I think that regulation is, you know, can, can actually push the direction that things can go? No, I don't. But I do think it can put up fences uh, uh, of, of various sorts that, that allow people to, to have their data be private, to, uh, uh, I mean, well, you know, one example is uh, uh, I no longer get, uh, uh, you know, uh, 50 random phone calls a day at, uh, at my home from people trying to uh, uh, sell me stuff because I put myself on a do not call list, mm. right? So that's, so that's a regulation that actually uh, dramatically improved my life. So we want regulations to protect us from AIs fielded by large companies. Well, what a <laughs> William Gibson future. And, 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 and even small companies, but uh, yeah. You're I, still gloomy, I, aren't I, we? I, I, no, but, no, you know, I, I, believe it or not, I'm an optimist mm. uh, at heart and over the long run. <laughs> I, I, I see, you know, I, I do see uh, uh, what uh, the, the problems are, but, but if I didn't see that there was a lot of good that can come from this, I would have run off to the hills a long time ago. 
uh, right, and, and have become a hermit. Well, I haven't, I've elected not to do that, and I've elected to stay engaged, because what I'm hoping that I can do, and, and the people that work with me and for me, is that we can help be, uh, we, we can help create the technology, but also be informed about it, and, and helping to uh, 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 people understand what both the benefits and the potential downsides are, such that people can make informed decisions. Great. Do we have another question from the audience? There's a hand there, hand there, hand there, free. There yeah, I, I have the microphone here. <laughs> <laughs> you have the power. He wins. Thank you. Uh, my name is Radar Wasenius. I work as a personal brainer. And originally, I studied uh, computer technology at the Helsinki University of Technology. But in the early 90s, I decided I didn't want to tell my grandchildren that I was you know, part of the establishment that built uh, Skynet and the Matrix and such. So I studied psychology. So, so now I, I do my best to help people to actually use their, their own brains. So my question to you, referring to this super interesting discussion here, is that um, what do you think if you look at, let's say, 10 years into the future when we have these increasingly really nice uh, anthropomorphic uh, intelligent systems, do you see them mostly being used by these more or less educated people on this planet as crutches, whereby they mostly outsource their you know, decision making and how many calories they consume and what they do? Or do you see them as having already then being helped people to become better themselves so that they are more developed human beings? I like to think if you look at the, the broader trend of technology, I mean, to me, I think the first time a cave person leapt on a horse is a form of technology in that you were extending your limbic capability. You were, you know, you were amplifying what it is you can do as a human. And if you look at the broad trend of technology, when we developed the printing press, we were amplifying the sort of sensory data we could get in. When we did machines, we were amplifying the impact, you know, the mechanistic impact we could have in the world. And, and at a very broad level, there's always, as you said earlier, been resistance to that. But fundamentally, once we've got through the pain of that, we have ended up with human beings who are freer to fulfill higher order functions. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in, in, in um, Zimbabwe in Africa, and I had a grandmother who still spent about eight hours a day um, washing her laundry on a, a, you know, one of those look, look, look a cheese grater. She, she needed her dough by hand. Someone chopped the wood to go in the coal fire to make her bread. And she was actually a gifted artist, and I never found out till she was 80, because she never had time to paint. So I suppose what I'm saying is that the, the broad trend of history, apart from Kim Kardashian and reality TV, is that we, we do actually tend to outsource the less interesting stuff. It also leads to less enslavement. You know, across, we live in a, a beautiful bubble of humanity, but you know, five billion of the world's population don't have an awesome day. You know, they do work up, wake up and do, do low-skilled work um, with, with minimal wage. And, and you know, to be able to free humanity up to, to fulfill higher functions is, is, I think, one of the greatest promises of AI. And on a, on a related and encouraging point, uh, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, he has an AI institute which is trying to do a, a learning agent to help children from the ages of about three to seven more effectively learn. And that's meant to be going out into emerging markets. You know, it's not associated with advertising or with a particular profit motive. It's done out of what appears to be altruism. So there's some encouraging signs here that people are thinking about ways this can help people who, who do need it and aren't as fortunate as we are. Yeah, well, we didn't blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons, at not least yet. not yet. That's good. <laughs> okay. that's, that's an encouraging pessimism, sign. Pessimism. And, 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 and the fact is that they're, you know, they're, they're really, you know, the, the, the future has a, has a huge breadth of possibilities out there. And it's, it's through the, 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 the single steps that people take every day that determine you know, which direction we wind up wandering uh, in, in this uh, uh, very large uh, uh, area. And I think it, it does, uh, I think we, you know, we, the, the, the people, the types of people who wind up being, coming to meetings like this, uh, have to take it upon ourselves some responsibility in helping nudge that future in, in, in the direction in which, uh, uh, you know, the, these, these become tools 
uh, for, for, for embetterment uh, rather than for, for enslavement. And mm. that, that's, uh, uh, you know, there, there always has to be the opportunity to not just talk about the technology per se, but about what the uses are. And I think that, that you know, gaming at, at the, you know, when you first hear that, it seems, okay, it's, it's just entertainment. It's just, uh, you know, a, a, a way of sucking money out of, uh, out of people. But uh, I think that done intelligently, done, done well, uh, this type of technology does have the, the, the capability of influencing people to, to uh, try to make themselves better, trying to, and try to help others uh, understand what the you know uh, uh, what the path is, and so I, you know, that, and that, that's the that's the origin of my uh, of of actually my uh, in, uh, uh, enthusiasm for, for for what's going to happen. Great. And well, what, what, just... one example of that, as well as admirable that that you gave up <laughs> the Borg and technology to to do very high touch stuff, you don't scale. Meat doesn't scale. Um, you know, except through procreation, obviously. But um, you know, we. We have a, a society where really I believe 30% of people will never get married, 25% will never have children. We have a, a, a wave, a tsunami of, of people who are going to move into retirement completely on their own, completely underserviced. You know, we have millions of children who just don't get the attention that they need. I mean, education. And, and there are well-meaning, wonderful human experts out there who could be modelled and who could be scaled. Um, in, in computer systems. Well, and this is the, the positive promise, but I'm getting the, the eye from off stage. So I think okay. that we're about to be kicked off. So if anyone has a final question, let's try and fit that in. Did we, we had one over here, and then I believe we'll have to vacate. Uh, hello. Uh, firstly, thank you for the great talk and great ideas. And uh, my question is following. So we are talking about systems in the future, which potentially we'll know almost everything about you, right? So about your preferences, probably about your performance on various tasks, maybe your performance under stress. And what do you think if uh, this information will be available to, let's say, your potential employees or maybe to government? Will it lead to this perfectly described world in science fiction film, which is called Gataka, when a particular person completely lacked track uh, his or her life, because all his future life was uh, predicted by his genome test. So, for example, by, based on this test, uh, it's not possible for this person to become a pilot or something like this. Does it mean that in this perfect world we will have the same issue when you will be regulated uh, based on this digital profile of you. Great. What a what a final question. All right. So, <laughs> so we've got thirty we'll, we'll, seconds. We'll try and keep this short. But <laughs> essentially, will our will our personal data ultimately imprison us, or will it will it help us have a, a, a wider and more enjoyable existence? Are you going to be pessimistic on this? No, I'm going to be. Well, I, oh. what I'll say is I'll just have to be optimistic on it. Because otherwise, you know, it's you know, uh, the, the, the future is just too is, is too bleak. But but the you know again the issue is that uh, uh, you know we do live in a democracy here in the United States anyway, and there are other democracies in the in the world. And what that means is that that people have to have a voice. They have to and they have to make their wishes known up through the system, literally to prevent that from happening. And if you don't, if you're not educated, if you don't understand what the consequences of some of these issues are, you can't make that choice, or you, or you, or you, or you won't bother to make the choice. It's only when people are are actively engaged uh, and uh, pushing uh, on on the system that that uh, that that you can uh, essentially, uh, 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 you know. Guarantee your privacy, and, and what, I, what I will say is that a huge amount of the actual technical work that we do in my lab is working on exactly that: how to guarantee privacy. And we run up against some governmental agencies or or, 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 or entities, shall we say, who are not happy about that. All right, but the, but you know, encryption and there are other 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 ways of doing it in order to make sure that that anything that identifies you is private. And as long as that's the law of the land, then, then, then that's the, the direction that we should be, tra be trending in. Positive. 
Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to take it to, to choice as well. You know, I think that I, I have a, a traffic app. So I have already made a choice to give my data as a trade-off for usefulness. And we're making this choice every day, sometimes multiple times an hour. The system knows who I've emailed, where I've gone, who I talk to, what I buy, when I buy it, why I buy it. One would hope that, that the trade-off of usefulness is one that I accept and I have the ability to continually decide if I accept it or not. If it delivers me a fresh order of groceries instead of that muffin, it's a useful trade-off. If it gets me to a venue faster, it's a useful trade-off. Um, and I hope and believe that we will keep as, as humanity saying, well, I demand that choice. And I have choice to move away from that service if, if it's no longer, you know, if, if, if the price is too high. Great. Well, thank you all for your time as well.